traditional custodians of this land whose cultures are among the oldest living in human history. We pay respect to the elders of the communities in the Murrumbidgee region and extend our recognition to their descendants, past, present and future. So, over to uh, Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Um, First of all, thanks for the opportunity for the, uh, the invitation to present to you all tonight. Um, so I'm from the uh, Major Projects Canberra team, uh, so I lead the, uh, the construction um, arm of uh, the Light Rail project team. Um, so we've got a couple of slides tonight, um, so I thought I'd give you all so we guess a bit of an update of where we're at with a few of our projects and sub-projects related to the Light Rail. So, um, so I'll, I'll go through this slide deck now. So, Light Rail project, so the first bit of works we've got at the moment is that we're doing some, well we've done some utility works on London Circuit on the west side. Um, it's in the final stages of, um, of the, the project. We've actually completed all the works. Um, there's only three little bits there. You can see in the three little colours um, on London Circuit there where it's just completion of defects effectively. So it's um, fixing up uh, final pavers just outside of 7 London Circuit, which is uh, uh, these, this blue and pink um, there, so I'm sure if, uh, people online can see that. Um, but that's, uh, that'll be completed uh, this week. Um, and next week, uh, we will commence the, um, this yellow section here on Farrell Place where we are going to uh, complete the um, road pavement for asphalt rectification. So this bit of work here should be done and dust in about a week and a half for those works. Uh, so the next update there, so Raising London Circuit, um, so I'm not too sure if everyone's sort of aware of what, um, what we're doing out there, but effectively um, in, on this map here, so you've got Commonwealth Avenue um, and going north to Burton Circle towards Civic, and uh, this red section here is the southern portion of London Circuit, where we've actually got it closed uh, between Edinburgh Avenue um, and then Const Constitution Avenue on the east side. So that allows us effectively to construct. What we've got to do is um, demolish the two existing bridges on Commonwealth Avenue here, um, and then fill the road to the, uh, the Commonwealth Avenue height, so it's about six metres um, high. For those of you who have travelled into the city uh, recently, so in the past two weeks, we actually did a slight shift in the um, alignment of Commonwealth Avenue here. Good. Uh, where you would notice that um, the northbound carriageway is now traversed slightly to the west into a temporary side track that we call it. Um, and the southbound traffic now has gone across the median and traversing now on the northern, existing northern carriageway. So what's, what that's done is allowed us room now to demolish this existing southbound bridge, um, which has just actually been completed um, uh, yesterday. So what that does now is allow us to fill this, uh, this eastern area of London Circuit um, and then in a few months time, probably towards the end of the year, um, we'll actually do a similar traffic switch will be, which will be on the other side um, of Commonwealth Avenue. Um, and with that, that allows us to then demolish the existing northbound bridge 
and that allows us to fill the remainder of the east, the western side of uh, London Circuit there up to the level of, of Commonwealth Avenue. Um, so with that, uh, we are looking for at a completion there by the end of next year as that is for project completion. Um, oh, actually, I might, we've got a, a quick video here which I might play. Um, I'm hoping it works on a different uh, PowerPoint presentation. So it's just a minute of just uh, just showing you how the um, the side track was built um, and and opened uh, to the to the motorists. Uh, for the 
project. Um, so similar to the green track prototype uh, so we have started um, in this area um, and again we are hoping to get completion of this by the end of the year um, for those works. So, uh, two small projects we're uh, yeah, aiming to complete in the next, in the next few months. So stage 2A, so pick up on that, um, so we now have the WA and DA uh, for the project um, and we're currently now just in discussions with the you know, possible contractors um, to deliver the project. Um, we are hoping to have someone on board uh, by the end of the year, um, is, is the target, and then we go into uh, detailed design um, next year. So the, uh, the intention is uh, to sort of commence sort of um, ground preparations for the completion of the RLC project towards the end of next year, um, and then the two-way contractor um, mobilises after that. Um, so that quick map there, so for, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with the project, um, so this quick map here, so effectively that blue section there is the, the current stage one system, and what we are doing is this red section here where we join on uh, to the existing Linga Street stop. Uh, we continue down the median of the Northbourne Plaza through here and then chuck a right turn into uh, London Circuit. And the rail or the track is effectively um, centre running down the centre of London Circuit. There'll be a stop at Edinburgh Avenue and then uh, continues in the centre of the London Circuit um, up the soon to be completed Raising London Circuit project um, and then another right turn here into the median of uh, Commonwealth Avenue. Um, straight after that turn there, there will be a, a, another stop um, in that zone and then all the way down to uh, Commonwealth Park here, so just, uh, just north of Albert Street uh, where there'll be a terminus. So that's, uh, I guess, the, the scope. Um, there is also a bridge that we've got to um, construct over, over Parksway. Um, so they'll be uh, constructed in between the two existing bridges um, that we're looking at. Uh, so this plan here, so this is actually just a partial plan. Um, so this is a, a, a view of, I guess, the, uh, the map of the city north of the lake. So the black outline that you see there is what our intended construction footprint is uh, for the stage two way project. So as you can see here, um, effectively there is that Alinga Street is where we tie in, um, in this area through here, but there is a portion that goes um, uh, further north to Allura Street to our existing substation there that was constructed in stage one. Um, and then also uh, obviously along um, London Circuit, there are portions of the side streets along the corridor that we've also taken, um, and then obviously down the, uh, the corridor there on Commonwealth Avenue. Because of the, uh, the construction of the bridge as well, um, we do have to take um, a portion of the uh, of Parksway there, so there will be some temporary traffic management that will, um, uh, that will be implemented um, during the build. Um, on that map as well, is, uh, you can see some of these uh, purple boxes there. Um, so they're our proposed site compounds for the project. So you can see that there's five there. Um, there's also another one of us up on the southern side of the lake. Um, but um, this one here next to Constitution is effectively the same compound as our um, Raising Light and Circuit contractor. Um, and similar with this one here at the corner of Gordon Street and Marcus Clark. Um, and there's one here also at Acton Waterfront. So the intention of that is effectively just a handover from one contractor to the, to the next. Um, we do, however, have two additional. So there's, um, there's a southern uh, car park uh, occupation that we've got there for another compound. Um, this compound here is effectively for um, another scope of works that we're looking at, which is an underball underneath Lake Burley Griffin. So there will be, a, um, I guess, a, an underbore or a launch shaft on the northern side here and then popping out on the southern side of the lake. Um, an underbore. An underbore. Uh, an underbore. B-O-R-E. Bore. Yeah. Uh, so, so the underbore is, is, is primarily for telecommunications um, uh, network. So what that'll do... Rooting under the lake. Under the lake. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll pop out on the southern side of the lake, um, but then there's further under bores um, and trenching works towards Treasury Building and also um, Questacon um, as part of those works. Um, so like I said uh, earlier, so the, the intention is to commence all these um, works post um, RLC. Um, we are looking at about a, a two-year two construction period, and then there's a period of about nine months of testing and commissioning after that. So all in all, you know, um, commencing sort of breaking around uh, early 2025, and that'll take us to end of 2027 um, for completion um, of two-way. So yes. No, it's only uh, only for uh, telecom conduits yes. or pipes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's it. That was it. Um, yeah, quite a few going on. But uh, yeah, if there's any any questions. Um, yeah. Benefit people who may miss the car. Um, just, uh, not a comment, but I suppose it's a comment, but uh, just a couple of requests. Is it possible for the council to get copies of that, those plans? Uh, this year? Yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, yeah, we can provide that. Yeah, okay. yeah. The other thing um, uh, might sound a bit strange, but I'd love to see you take all that hoarding down off the fences going all around that area because. Um, you might think you're getting a bit of bang for your buck with that up there, but I reckon it'd be better if people could see what what's going on. Oh, you mean you the, uh, of the, the shape cloth well, on the on the Yeah, the shape cloth, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't see a thing. And um, I've walked over there a couple of times and you still can't see anything, really. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you know, like if you go past in the bus or a car, well, yeah, I reckon it'd be good. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, there's, there are opportunities, yeah, to remove some of those. Um, it, it's sort of a fine line because it does act as a, like I said, a gawking deterrent as well for, for the passers-by yeah, yeah, yeah. um, on the side there. But it also, you know, if there is some minor dust and, and stuff like that, it does, you know, it will stop it against the, um, the, the footpaths. We're only going to the now anyway. Got that. It's one there. And then we're going to get it. Um, so my question is, um, when will the current works be complete, and when uh, when will stage two uh, A be complete? Yeah. So um, what we are looking at is uh, going to be, uh, I guess, uh, a finished start um, for, for both projects. So uh, the current RLC project is planned to complete by the end of next year, so end of twenty twenty four. Um, so from then, the intention is. Um, the site compounds that you saw there, it's effectively, you know, they'll move out and then a new contractor comes in. Um, and uh, the new contractor will, will break ground, you know, early 2025, um, and then complete everything. Uh, construction is about two years, but then there's a period of testing uh, for the new light rail vehicles. That'll take us to the end of 2027. Thank you for that. It's a, it's a complex project, isn't it? Oh, it looks simple yeah, a, when it's it's you look at it. It's a bit going on. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, I know there's, there's a lot of concern in the establishment of the disruption task force to make sure that everyone knew what was going on. Safety was a big thing. How have you, how's it gone with safety for, for drivers and push bike riders and pedestrians? Yeah, for all that, so um, one thing for from a traffic management point of view, so we've got a forum called the um, Temporary Traffic and transport uh, liaison group. So that, that TTLG is what we call it, is the acronym. Um, so we have a number of, um, I guess, representatives um, or memberships in that, which includes TCCS, the buses, um, CRA, emergency services, uh, and also the NTAs in there as well. So any, um, I guess, any temporary traffic uh, proposal setups um, by anyone, even including uh, not just our project, but also third parties, other developers, gets presented at that, um, at that forum, um, and it gets endorsed first, so everyone's got, you know, their two cents worth, and, uh, you know, with the, any objections or um, the like, um, before it's actually submitted for, for approval. So there's a, there's a level there of, of, I guess, filtering before it just goes and gets, gets approved. Um, and for that one, I actually chair that, uh, that meeting, so <laughs> not too much gets through. <laughs> 
Thank you. It's really yeah, it's very interesting. Well, seeing that you're not going to put it the second stage, stage two B, under the lake, has there been a proposal yet? How they're going to do it? Uh, there is isn't not not under the lake. <laughs> no. So the, the only the only under the lake works we're doing is just the the telecom um, services. Um, so at the moment we are looking at um, yeah, it's 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 an over. A, a breach structure over the lake. Um, but then we're still going through some, uh, some optionary uh, at the moment, so nothing set in stone in terms of what, uh, what we're doing at that stage. It's still highly secretive. No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's still in development. <laughs> Can't let you get off that easy. <laughs> um, I heard you chair a certain meeting, the transport whatever meeting. Yep. Now, we keep on getting comments wherever I go that the buses are running early because they're overcompensated in their schedules. They've wound back the services and they've in effect given all our bus drivers an extra 10 minute break at the end of all their runs. It's common for a bus from here to run early, i.e. seven or eight minutes, even after it stops the timing points and waits. So I wonder how sceptical you get when they come in with their, this is how we'll react when you get to your meeting. And yeah. something you might want to take away. Or, no, I might do that because I think it's more for TCCS to, to answer that, that question. But um, the TTLG, so um, yeah, Transport Canberra and City Services um, are members of that, that group. So they do have input and evidence that's coming in. So if there are, I guess, impacts to buses, um, you know, that, that is noted. Um, if there are any actions that we need to look at in terms of um, you know, if there is a temporary closure of a bus stop, for example, or if you know for a, a, a certain period there is a short detour, that needs to be you know, really detailed in those plans. Um, and it'll only be implemented if it's approved by both Transport Canberra and City Services. Yeah, we did invite TCCS to come along and talk to us about this issue in the context, but we didn't hear back from them. So I'm afraid I had to ask the question to somebody. Yeah. Um, other issues that are coming up um, are around access to the light rail stations in the future and with the, how well you're going to comply with the Disability Discrimination Act changes that are due out shortly, whether you've been monitoring them as they've been developing. Because there's some interesting stuff in there and I don't know that stage one would be compliant. And I think people from here will be very interested to make sure if they're going to use light rail, that where they interact with light rail or intersect with it, it's designed well and it meets their needs. And let's face it, who if you're able-bodied, if you get a bit of access to a station, you're more likely to use it because you're going to get a better customer experience. But if you are in a wheelchair or you have another disability or a sight problem, it could be the difference between you using the service or not. So I know you probably haven't, I know, I know because we talked about when we came in here, you haven't been made aware of this, but that's something I'd like you to take into account going forward. And when the reference groups meet, perhaps be cognizant that it's go it is becoming quite a live issue. The other issue I'm hearing here is around the Deakin Health Precinct. And I know that's stage 2B, but I'm just flagging where this community is interested. It's, it's a terrible place to get to now. And if you can't drive, it's almost impossible to get to unless you've got a friend. 
We have not designed our public transport around the development of Deakin and all the specialists moving in there. And it's causing a lot of people issues. And it shouldn't be that hard to fix. So if we're developing modern transport, part of the modern is making the key parts accessible. So we'll be keeping on on that point as well. No, I think I think, so. I think it's in sort of those. I think there's two sort of two parts that um, both take on notice. I think uh, for both of them. Um, our our planning director uh, was able to come tonight, but he would have he would have easily answered the questions. So we might uh, you know get him to sort of respond to that um, in, in writing. Um, in terms of 2B, I think what's, what's probably the best way to do that? We get those and then we will respond to... Well, I think with 2B as well, we, we will be starting quite detailed community consultation on, on stage 2B. Um, certainly probably early next year, so I think that's when we'll be able to go out to the community and really discuss what those requirements are, for the stops, for the connection, um, for what the community needs from that part of the alignment. So, um, I think that's a bit of a watch this space and there's a lot of engagement that we need to do with the community around that. Yeah, they are running a community reference group and the council is a representative on it and we've certainly been representing what we've been hearing. There hasn't been enough really come out to into a proper feedback session yet, but this is why we thought get the people working on it to come and talk to us and tell us what they're thinking. What we're there again, and to see if we can put some input into design. Yeah, and we've got some great representation on our CRG, including Bill, so you know, there's the opportunity to really hear about what the community needs from that part of the line. Do you think we can check your mind? And certainly we'll come back with that disability reform agenda question. I'm sure that the team is looking into that. Just a query with the stage 2A, the pigs have gone and are moving them back again. The one more. Uh, did you want the map, was it? No. The one where you had the stations for the Stage 2A. It was Edinburgh Avenue and <coughs> London Circuit. Yes, that one. You see the city south there? Is that on Parks Way? Uh, it's, it's between Parks Way and London Circuit, so just, just to the south of that. Uh, so, where would you get the people there? Because it's north of Commonwealth, that Commonwealth Park, Florian. So it seems to be people living on the west side of London Circuit would get the Edinburgh Avenue one. So who would get on the city south one? There's nothing there. Yeah, I, th I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, Tanya, but uh, um, I believe there is um, a lot of development, future development aspirations um, on this western side, especially on the Afton waterfront. Um, I don't have too much details of that yet, but I think that was sort of part of the, uh, the decision making um, for that stop. So, so it is for, I guess, future proofing as well. And, uh, and then it's also a good stop for people to access the other side of the city as well. It's quite a short walk. Um, but definitely it's also about the future development. It's future proofing that area with the stop that will service a lot of new development. So, is it sounds like it's about the people that I really don't know, that's not the director of the government as to what their plans are in that area. Well, how will the Florida people go? Because it's a fair distance for the group that off the bus to walk in Florida, but I'll probably walk up the south station. This one here? Yeah, so... um. Yeah, so through here, there's actually going to be some new, um, I guess, upgraded pedestrian crossings in the area. Um, through there, so it gets you, yeah, from the west side to the east side. So, yeah, from... Yeah, not across the <coughs> but from the city south rail station. Yeah. Right, it's quite a distance down from here. Come off the yeah. stop. 
Um, can I have a shot of this? Um, in the consultation, firstly on the Commonwealth Park, I got a bit excited on the stop because you are going to get people transferring from buses to light rail. And I made a submission on it and suggested you consider running the buses on a joint route with the light rail. I.e. you bring the buses into the Commonwealth Park stop so you stop people crossing three line lanes of traffic. On the city south, well, in particular, there's a whole lot of people like lawyers, etc., who work down in that zone along in Avenue. That, um, and there's also people like me who would love to have easy access on public transport to get that to the Palace Cinema. I refuse to. Hope you're listening, Andrew. I refuse to pay for any of Andrew Barr's parking, so I will use his public transport as much as I can, and I can see a nice walking trail down to the cinema and over to the um, Film and Sound Archive, back end of ANU, the Shine Dome, and also even walking over to the National Museum. That will be the, the two points that will make, make it best to access from. So, they do, they do expect that the Edinburgh Avenue stop will be the busiest, not the second yeah. busiest stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the busiest. They're, yeah. they're expecting it to be the busiest stop on the line. So it does service a big period of area. Uni students, residents, lots of businesses. Uh, sorry, I may have missed it before. Can you just explain exactly where the one closest to the lake is located in relation to, say, the current pedestrian crossing? Yeah, so this one here, come on yeah, yeah. So it's um, the terminus is just north of Albert Street. Um, Albert Street intersection, yeah. What's Albert Street? Yeah, so there's the yeah, Albert Street that's, yeah, yeah. goes to the west and also the east. So that's fine for Florida. Yep. Except that uh, there will probably be a lot less parking, or well, there will be a lot less parking uh, from West Basin. Yep. Maybe no parking. During construction? No, in the end. In the end. But it's probably not going to roll the common No, yeah, it's a, that's, but, a, but that's a different direct route. Yeah. yeah. Well, yep. I mean, they're. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just postulating now, but I mean, it seems that help me encouraging people to come from somewhere on light rail or buses to get the Florida out or go in park near the pool or something. But there will not be any parking in West Basin, I would say, of any large amount as there is at the moment. So, you know, there it is. What will there be a future stadium, I think? Joke. Um, John, no, correct. There will this is why we have to keep a really vigilant eye on this to make sure we get the best the outcome for our community out here. So people who commit to work, who and there are, you, you get the early morning R7 bus and you see the people traipsing across from the Commonwealth Park stop now in all sorts of weather and you go, why are they doing that? And then you have a look and you go, well, that is the closest. It's bizarre because there's no real bus service into City West. I want to encourage public transport. You need to provide the facilities. So running around there is good. Um, the other point in this is if the police station moves, are you going to stop the right end turns out of that police station? area like change the design because my experience from driving in Melbourne cars doing right hand turns across the front of the tram my right vehicle I'm sorry is not the safest way of operating and I understand the police want to keep their access to go in and out but if they're moving would you redesign that area yeah I mean it's at the moment, the current design for them, which they're, they're at Knowles Place, um, so it's, it's, it's in this zone through here. Um, 
other ones you get in and out of Knowles Place is a left in, left out, um, is how we've got it. Now, on the southern intersection of Knowles Place, there is an opportunity there for emergency vehicles to turn right, but only under lights. So it's only under emergency situations. Okay. The general movement is a left in and then a left out only. Okay. Yeah. That's far better. Could I just uh, indulge my pedal power interests and move completely away from this site over to uh, the Arboretum with, the, with your uh, interesting thing there. Um, there's a lot, a lot of people whiz around that road around Dairy Farmers Hill. It's one of the training tracks for people. Plus you also got the mountain bike circuit. People will use through there as a safer option to stronger. Is, is any of that going to affect the roads as far as people go driving or something? In terms of our prototype we're building yeah, there? Yeah. No, no, so it's, um, yeah. uh, it's, it's built to the side um, okay. through there, so yeah, we don't impact any roads at all. Doesn't touch, that's okay. That's okay. Thank you. I hear somebody else have a question. No? 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 Come on, you're leading him off too easily. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it, it, there was one comment you made earlier about, you know, some of the lessons learned, um, you know, um, from stage one. A hundred percent, you know, we, we've taken the stage one, the, the, you know, the goods out of that. Um, but one thing we've sort of gone further, especially from our construction team with an MPC, is our construction team, we've actually called um, from uh, the delivery team of Sydney Library and also Gold Coast Library. Mm. So we've got some key experts from a delivery point of view to grab all the good things out of that and implement it in stage 2A. Because it is, you know, we are working right next to businesses, so it's the guys who have experience, you know, building um, right next to those, you know, some key stakeholders. So that's... Okay, there's a trip acid in Linga Street. How do I know? Because it got me. Um, the raised curb as you're going into the station, platform area, in certain light conditions, you can't see it. And when you've got people coming out of the light rail vehicle, fibre dress, trying to get out, and somebody's going contra peak, like me, you get herded straight into that curb. I'm not the only person that's happened to. Um, I'm just wondering if you keep that in mind. It's just a grey curve. And when I went in there, I was eaten by bushes. Went straight into it. Apparently, it made quite a scene. I went around the family. People who knew me saw me. <laughs> in, stop the hell. They stayed in there. White right way on left. But um, I've heard from other people who've been caught by it as well. So these are the sorts of things that need to be learned. It, this is curving around garden beds, was that the...? Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's, it's the visibility of that. Yeah. So for me, I tripped over and up, yeah. dust myself off, went on my journey. But for somebody a bit frail, these things can be life altering. We just need to be cognizant of that as we yeah. proceed. Look, you may have, this question may have been answered, so forgive me if I haven't heard the answer. But why couldn't you just go straight over the hill uh, instead of going the, around London Circuit and having to raise over it? Over City Hill? Yeah. Um, there might be a more formal response to this, um, to him, but I think, uh, from my understanding, is uh, so that is heritage listed. Um, so yeah, coming. But is that the reason? I know it's heritage listed, it's, but is that the reason? It's probably one of the reasons. Um, yeah, but I think um, as well, it's possibly geometry as well. So it's a geometry instead of you know going the vertical geometry. The possible. Other. Well, there's certainly a lot of geometry in raising London Circuit. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't mind hearing a comprehensive answer to that question yeah, somewhere. Well, I haven't heard it. Yeah, might do that. Right, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the real reasons. The city is beautiful anyway. You wouldn't want to chop that up for it. For anything, for the rabbits are. Who wants to get to the rabbits are? Who wants to get to the rabbits are? I got an answer, I 
extracted at one of these consultations on that very point, which was they want to develop West City as an employment hub and a residential hub to activate it. You've got the university there, and there'll be new buildings going in. We've seen new DAs go in for various buildings. It'll become an employment centre as the city moves that way. Maybe we'll be better about getting people around. So I think that's the answer I extracted. Yeah, there are various, and that's definitely one. It's just yeah. to accommodate more people. Um, it's a shame you couldn't have taken Ross Russell Hoyt's um, video on how to do with rabbits and applied it to Sydney Hill because it would have actually cleared the land for you to go straight over. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's worth looking. I'll have to search for it. <laughs> um, is there any more questions here? Yeah. Yeah. John. Uh, look, I think the answer on City Hill is exactly what Bill said. I mean, uh, most of Stage 2B, to me, seems to be doing its very best, or the proposed route, seems to be doing its very best to avoid any live people who might be customers. Because uh, the proposed route seems to, um, you know, wind its way nowhere near living people unless it does go across the front of our Parliament House. Uh, but the original route up straight up to State Circle and out down Adelaide Avenue, uh, you, you know, you're out in the boondocks, there's, there's nothing there. There might be something eventually, but um, there's nowhere near the same opportunities for high rise or any other development along the whole length of Adelaide Avenue uh, because it's already occupied by small buildings uh, and a lot of it's geographically not suitable to, um, you know, there's all sorts of intersections, or not intersections, but you know, dips down into Deacon and all that sort of stuff where it's you know, not going to be easy to build. And to my knowledge, the only bit of land the government's got is the one on the edge of the diplomatic precinct. Um, so, I mean, I'm not anti light rail, but I just think the route, as proposed before, the government's half changed its mind about running through Treasury and you know, through Old Parliament House, which is a much better idea, but slower. But, uh, you're at least trying to pick up customers. Yeah. Um, well, this is what we definitely want to hear yeah. when we start. The rest of Adelaide Avenue is, uh, I mean, people will fight like fury about um, the, uh, the mint ovals. They'll fight like fury against all the uh, poplars in Lower Curtain, including myself. And I hope Emma will too. Um, so the only bit I can see where it's readily able to build any building is, you know, a 200 metre strip outside the diplomatic zone. Um, that's why I say the route is trying its best to avoid people. It won't go to the hospital, which is, you know, you, you, you've got this conflict between a fast service and a, a service that helps people. Um, you can't have both. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, there's something else I was going to say as well, but uh, it escapes me. Sorry. I will refrain. Thank you. Um, I've got one very quick question. That City South stop, do you think that might be a stop that's used by people accessing things like the Civic Pool and the National Convention Centre? You mean the stadium? I did not say that. I no, no. Um, I'll, I'll give it to John the Tick, and we might close unless there's further questions. Um, from New Bell, what's getting me is Adelaide Avenue, and I'll tell you scope now, it's going to have to look like St Kilda Road for light rail to work. I like St Kilda Road, nice boulevard, people can live, because one of the basics of life is to have accommodation. And one of the pressures we've got is we've got more people looking for housing, fewer housing available, 
all us in housing are bidding up the price. So something's got to happen. But anyway, over to John. I've forgotten my comment. <laughs> uh, I'm just going back to the, the construction, I suppose, which is more relevant, really. Um, is, is the new roads you're putting in, are they going to be part of the intersection, or are you going to dig them up again? Or? Uh, it's a the temporary road. The temporary road. Um, so the, the temporary road that's being built by Brazen Lemon Circuit. So this one here is only yeah, that's that's temporary. So that'll be removed. Um, so once the uh, the intersection is completed, up you know six metres high and level at Commonwealth Avenue, that's when the two-way project comes in. So that bit of, no, but that bit of bitumen doesn't form part of the intersection in the final plan. Not the temporary bit. No, yeah, no, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, I, I realised what I was going to say now, but going back to what Emma said, I, mean, I, I really disagree with that. I mean, people don't want to walk from that station to Constitution Avenue. I mean, it's a mile. It's, no, one, no one wants to do that. Um, that's why, and, yeah, I can rattle on about this all night, I've always thought light rail should go around, go around London Circle totally. That's could be done later on, but to pick up people on both sides. Um, anyway, that's all. What you were saying, show us a strategic plan of where light rail is going to go, the full model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving down later, you've got all those people, zillions of people living in flats and apartments and camera centres. Yeah. Light rail is going to be the other side. It just seems nonsensical. It's got nothing to do with going to the airport or going to the place or anywhere else. You've, you've just taken probably 30% of the potential customers into the group, 70% can walk a mile around. I used to work out at Hobart Place. None of us wanted to ever walk to the campus centre lunchtime because it took 15 minutes to get over there and 15 minutes to get back. By the time you did it, you didn't go. No. Talking about the where our parliament house etc. appears, I'd like to see the light rail being express and shuttle buses because you get a lot of tourists that want to get on and off to go around all those places. And I know originally when they were proposing it, I think Chris Steele said no one will have to work, walk any further than 800 metres. Well, I'm in an elderly sort of social group and a lot of older people can't walk that far. And we have outings to go to these places, so we have to be forced to take a car because you can't walk from Albert Hall to the art gallery and all this sort of thing because there's no bus service. So I'd like to see the shuttle buses, and even in Civic, to, if you want to get off the light rail station, get a shuttle bus to go to the convention centre. They used to have one once and then it disappeared. Yeah, anyway. Oh, jolly not. I've just delivered a friend who went overseas twice recently and to stop at jolly not, it's impossible. I had to stop in a permit site because there was nowhere to stop and let her off or just to pick her up. And the front of it, I did end up there once because there was a vacancy, it must have been just a fluke. A couple of times I went past there and there was nowhere to stop to let her off. You think we've got suitcases as well. Um, can, I, yeah, can I come in on that? Sorry to catch off there, Val. In the reference group, we've been submitting that this stuff needs to be taken into account. Access the institutions and a few of the support and the other places we talk about. We need to improve that experience. One, you know, there's a number of possibilities, but we can't be blind to it and just dump people to their stops without reasonable access, or you're reducing the effectiveness of the chosen mode of transport. What they're trying to do is get as many people onto it. Well, I don't want people being hermits. We want people having access to their city reasonable access, it's an equity issue, and as you rightly point out, well, 
if you drive in there and you've got no parking, you can go home. Or you'll go somewhere else. So that last mile, or last 100 metres, really needs to be carefully thought through. And I think that's a broader job for TCCS. You guys are putting white rail through. And unfortunately, TCCS didn't come this evening. I'm saying that in front of two of our MLAs very deliberately. They were invited and we didn't hear back from them. Just note that everyone. Because I wanted to ask them these very questions. Are there any more questions to come? I'd like to thank you all for coming and brave and boys. Come on, show hands, please.
Yeah, Nora. Yeah. Well, I also think that it would be a good idea many years ago where you guys used to hold the trees and 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 the trees. Okay, so for people uh, who are watching the live stream, uh, Lady Nora was just saying that um, years ago we used to hold these kinds of meetings ourselves and people could come along and, and you know, engage there. Um, where, when we used to hold those meetings, uh, they, they would have been maybe for a, you know, a broader geographic area than the, the current community councils. Do you think that there's some really good value in, in having something the size of, say, a, a district um, area like the whole of Western Creek rather than, say, a whole of Canberra for a more discussion? So we can talk about you know, um, place-based decision-making as well in local communities? <laughs> no, I was just saying that you used to do both, I think. You used to hold one for all and then you would go to the separate districts as well. So all, all the ministers, you would all be there. And so that we would all talk to all of you and you know, raise issues. And that, that was really that really worked. It was good. Yeah, I, I remember those days of the community cabinet meetings. Um, yeah. Um, although, I mean, there, there is one of the nice things about a community council is there's a meeting every month on the same night of each month. And so, um, you know, that, that does make it a little easier for people to go, right, I can, I can make it this month, so I'm, I'm going to go and ask my questions. Um, are, there, are there things about... Um, the, the way that, or, or the, the roles and responsibilities of community councils that you think could be changed that would make it make the process more effective? The, I know a lot's been going on uh, very recently, and I think it was kicked off with Malongo, uh, and since then Bill's uh, also been talking, and uh, I've been out, I haven't seen it, I've been on the, the council here, although we've been away a lot, that age where we've got caravans and we go to have another life somewhere else with family, etc. So that the, uh, if I could make the broad observation, uh, community councils struggle because I think primarily they feel they're not being taken seriously enough. And that's reflected by things like the continuity of the presence of uh, community members, for a start, let's just be clear about that. Although I do acknowledge that a really good number of people on the, on the stream, and I credit Bill with getting that going, and, uh, and all those who, who manage it, so that's a great way of doing things. Um, the, the other part is obviously the presence of MLA, so my question is, is what is this worth to an MLA? Because people can talk directly to an MLA. Uh, the other one at the higher level in, uh, in ACC government is there's a number of ways of talking to the ACT government. And we can go through ministers to get to those particular areas. We'll go to the chief minister and get distri distributed out. And there's also the your say system. So relative to all those, those great communication sources, the voice of the community council has basically shrunk to the bottom of the pile equivalent to, to, to an individual writing letters, for instance. So, so there, there is, I think, a fundamental uh, question about what is the worth of the community council and what you were just asking there, to what, what value is it providing, how is it recognised by, by the people this stuff's going to, and, and is this a one-way discussion or is this a two-way discussion? I think that's your other point, isn't it? So, so if we don't get asked questions and all we do is provide submissions and, and and sort of basically whinge from the sides, that's what it feels like at times, and then don't get acknowledgement uh, or get engaged in, in, in you know, next level engagement. I'm not talking about, you know, so, you know coming up with solutions and options and that sort of things. Then, then eventually, uh, probably like a number of other volunteers, after a while you think, okay, I'll do it for a while, but I'll just move on. I've got other things I can, I can do. And uh, so it just doesn't feel worth it to be honest, at times. I, c I can absolutely understand that. When, when, I, when I think about what it is that I get from 
going to community council meetings, it's a real place-based kind of feedback that I don't get from, say, for example, the advisory councils that I have access to as a minister. So because I'm, the min I'm basically a minister for people, I've got mental health, disability, veterans and seniors and um, carers and volunteers and, you know, all of, all of the things. Um, there are advisory councils um, that I can go to for specific advice about, you know, for example, uh, what do what do veterans need? What do older people in Canberra need? Um, what do people with mental health conditions need? And there are advisory councils for all of those specific things. But what the community councils do for me that is something quite unique to community councils is place-based kind of advice about what's different about the Western Creek community compared to, say, the Longlo or Woden or Tuggeranong or the Inner South. Um, and they are all different, they are all different communities with different demographics and different interests and different problems that people are grappling with in, at a, a local level. Um, but one of the really big differences between advisory councils and community councils is that advisory council members um, receive uh, uh, remuneration um, in return for the, the time and, and work that they put into that advisory work that they do. Um, and they, part of their role is to maintain their connections to networks within the area that they are an advisory council on um, as a way of sort of drawing in that, that knowledge from that area and, um, and then also disseminating information back. So, you, you know, that's, that's um, something that, that takes into account their, their other roles that they might have, whereas, you know, community councils where you're reliant on volunteers who have the capacity, um, it, it's, you know, it's not necessarily compensated in the same way and it does make it very hard for people to keep doing the work, as you quite rightly point out. It is, it is a lot of work. Um, and we don't necessarily uh, treat it the same way as some of the other advisory bodies. But then on the other hand, the advisory council memberships um, go through a cabinet approval process. Your community councils are absolute grassroots participatory democracy where you decide who's on your community council and uh, the members of the assembly don't actually get any say in it, which is probably quite a healthy thing for democracy as well. So these are, these are things for us to think about too. Okay, thanks, sir. That's a good response. The, um, I think it could be something as simple as being recognised by, by just a simple pat on the back to the chairman or, or recognition. Uh, you don't even get a cup of tea with the minister or the chief minister. For all the work that people like Bill and Michelle put in, yeah. it's not recognised. There's no recompense. Yeah. Uh, so happy, no, I think everyone's happy to be a volunteer, don't need the money, but it would be nice to get a pat on the back and a cup of tea. It is a lot of work, yes. Yes. And I, I think that it is a lot of work and that if people want the best value, they really need to focus on what they do want from the council as well. And yeah, like people just don't do town hall meetings um, much anymore. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we're living proof and I don't think it's because the topics aren't interesting. I don't think it's because people aren't interested in the topics. I just think it's a changing way of communicating and um, I just think perhaps an older generation perhaps came out and, and when, when communities are forming and everyone's got new houses and different different sort of feel but I think more established older communities I don't think um, town hall meetings are there uh, every month are really their preferred way of doing things anymore so I think we have to sort of think a bit more about how people actually do connect. Yeah, yeah. Just to, just to add to Michelle's point there, um, so you mentioned earlier you know, that there was a benefit to the, the fact that we run a, a meeting in a, the same location on the same night sort of every month, which is a benefit, but it also hamstr hamstrings us in a way because it means that, um, you know, if, if members of the community can't make uh, the meeting at 7.30 on a weeknight when they've got kids to feed and, you know, their lives to live. It sort of excludes those people from this process. Mm -hmm. um, and actually running these meetings um, you know, in the same spot at the same time uh, every month is, is a condition of the grant. Um, so we actually don't have a lot of freedom or flexibility in how uh, we choose to meet as a council. 
uh, and that, that is something the government can do is maybe make that a bit more flexible so that we can you know, go to where the people in the community are or, or reflect uh, changing preferences in how people want to meet and how they want to be engaged. Yeah, yeah. I have noticed that you do get some good engagement through your, your live stream and, and people even being able to watch the video after, even if they can't you know, um, participate during the live stream itself, um, which I, I must say I, I do actually appreciate that I can go there and see what people are talking about um, online as well because I know that there are people who, you know, either because of um, their health or their caring responsibilities or their work hours can't always physically attend. Um, any other thoughts about? Uh, yeah, I was just going to comment. Um, I agree with the last few speakers. I think uh, I'm not knocking the current model. Look, I don't do anything here except come along and say a few things sometimes. Uh, there are dedicated people who do, but they're few in number and I don't see that changing. Uh, I think there's more value probably in you know, the, uh, what do you call it, public media, I can't think of the right word. Um, you know, Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, there's quite lively discussions goes on on Facebook. You know, about how I follow stuff out of Malongolo and, uh, you know, there's, people will participate if they just sit at home and comment. I mean, you know, you make what you like of the comments, but just wonder whether the government could use that as mediums better yeah. to seek opinions rather than um, use the old ways which uh, you know rely on just a few people to do everything yeah like me yeah do as someone who's probably had a little bit to say on this of late um i think the model's broken Yes, the burden of charging down here and spending 45 minutes to an hour sitting up and then a bit of time packing up without really knowing who's going to attend your meeting. Um, the speakers, the guys are not good, but you know, they deferred it from the previous meeting. At least they came along, but the speakers' names change regularly over the last short while. Um, some of the directorates, their performance has been falling, and I'm speaking kindly, in terms of their engagement. Um, we've got a major construction going on here um, on a number of fronts, and you'd think they'd be ready to pop in and give us an update. They haven't. You'd think seeing the responsible minister, are you listening? Um, seeing the responsible minister um, he's also one of our MLAs and heading up for a popularity contest next year. You think he might pop in and have a chat? No. Um, so I'm being a bit brutal here. People are putting too much effort in for the return. And I will say I was really offended when I read that um, Hansard, when the Chief Minister answered those questions asked by Andrew Braddock, especially the final one, he relies on your say. In other words, he's not interested in listening to the community opinion. Because your say doesn't get an opinion, it harvests the answer he wants. The questions are closed, there's very little room for real input, and quite frankly, maybe he's, they've been there 20, 25 years or whatever, Maybe they think they've got it nailed. Um, I don't know, and I'm, I'm trying hard not to be political. I'm just sort of going, what can we do? What can we do better? Um, we've still got a community here, but I'd say most people feel they're rather ignored. They're not getting input, or the government will just do what it wants. Um, and there's a number of things in my three years in the chair we've run and campaigned hard on. We've had some movement, and some of it's been good. A lot of hard work's gone into it. And we've used the full armory to get there to persuade people. And part of it, I think, is they're not gonna go away, we've gotta throw them something. But we still keep on hearing the same things. 
Um, one example, why did it take two years to get the font size changed on bus time tables? No intent as well. You know, some people think I go on about the bus time tables, but it's indicative of people not being able to get good access to their city, the place they live. If they can't see what time their bus is going to come, they're going to stay at home, yeah. not go out. No, they're just little things. Yeah. And the directorates don't get it. A lot of people in the directorates, I think, are disconnected from the people. And the latest I, I find it quite offensive is sending things out by email without a contact number, leaving to a council chair, putting these out by email, and then you need to return the email saying, yeah, we'll decide how important your request is and get back to you within 28 days. <laughs> Are they really serious about engagement? Yeah, I think that's what you, you know, we're just going to take the time to come out of their business schedule. Yeah, I'm Catherine. Catherine, you know, I'm going to use your voice. Oh. Well, I don't really want one. This is Catherine. She doesn't come very often. She's very fine. I don't know about that. But, um, yeah, everybody is time poor, so they will choose the mechanism that they want to uh, engage through. It could be your say on an individual level, or they might come along, uh, you know, occasionally once a month and uh, be part of the community and give a more collective point of view. Um, but at the end of the day, who you always wants to know, well, I've taken the time, so how are you going to feed back to me what a process you've gone through to consider the feedback I've given you and keep me engaged with whatever process you're going along with in the background. Mm -hmm. So that feedback loop, um, when it gets broken, community might go, well, what is the point? Yeah. Um, I haven't heard back from you. Maybe you didn't value my comments. Um, is it reasonable to take 28 days to get back to what? Yeah, the council, I guess, if, if their community councils are supposed to be the voice uh, or the conduit between community and government. Yeah. So is there a recognition or acknowledgement that they are the yeah. conduit or not? Yeah, so you, it needs to be a conversation rather than a broadcast and feedback mechanism. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yes. I think the other main thing is real community engagement and consultation takes time yeah. and um, government could do well to recognise that. Absolutely. It yeah. does take time. And it takes a lot of effort from everyone involved. Exactly. Um, and so just a comment on your say, not that it applies to this particular community, but um, putting something up on your say, particularly for a disengaged community, and it's wondering why you've had no response might be um, a really telling kind of feedback loop in itself Absolutely. Um, that government could do well to address. Yeah. yeah. So um, can I just say thank you very much for indulging me there in um, letting me ask you a question for a change. Um, this is something that I think we really need to grapple with as a community. There's one of, the, one of the things that's happened over the last few years as we've dealt with things like bushfires and the COVID pandemic and you know, the, the, the things that we know are coming in our future um, in terms of um, difficult situations that as a community we're, we're going to have to get through together is that the only way we get through these things is when community, um, as in you know, individual people in the community as well as our community sector, as well as government, as well as private sector business are all working together towards the same end goal of this is actually where we want to get to. It's how we got through things like, um, uh, you know, dealing with, um, you know, a quarter of our city being in quarantine at the same time and people not being able to put food on the table. It was how we got through, for example, um, the situation with the, the smoke and people not being able to go to their workplace because it was full of smoke um, and having to work out well, how, do we, how do we still function as a community if we can't do things the way we used to. Um, we know that there are going to be more situations like that in our future, but we haven't necessarily got the mechanisms 
to, to be able to have those conversations, the, the two-way conversations, to work out solutions to those things right at the moment. And I'm looking for how do we get there, how do we solve that. I'm also thinking in the more immediate future, over the next few months, there's a number of um, big policy problems that we're, I'm going to need to solve that I'm responsible for as a minister. And I would like to be able to come to you and ask for your thoughts on these things and be able to have that as a conversation rather than as a me doing a PowerPoint broadcast um, and, and you giving feedback back. I would much rather have that as a, a conversation if you're up for it. Now, the only difficulty for you is, unfortunately, I'm not the planning minister, I'm <laughs> not the transport minister. So um, I don't know if these are the kinds of things that, that you're interested in, but you know, it's things like, are we ready for the next um, high risk weather season in terms of bushfire and storms? Um, are, we, are we thinking about what kind of changes are needed to be a more inclusive and accessible city um, in terms of uh, people with disability being able to fully participate? Um, are we thinking about uh, the mental health of, of both older people and younger people? So I've got people at both ends of, of the, the age spectrum talking to me about climate grief and climate anxiety. Um, are we thinking about the inequality crisis and, and um, how we create more equitable um, situations for people in terms of their housing, their ability to get education and jobs and things like that? I'd like to be able to come and have those conversations if, if you're up for it. Can I um, finish off what I was trying to say to uh, the community actually don't get represented. When you get, you have one on one on one uh, conversations privately, the community do not get represented. So this is why it worked when it was the ministers all got together and we were all in the room together with all the ministers and we could target every problem with each minister because they were all present. Mm. At, at your meetings and that's why it's better really so that the community do get heard, the entire community yeah. get heard at your own meetings that yeah. you hold. But you're all there and all these subjects can be addressed. Yeah. So that's why it would be good to go back. Town Hall I agree because people who are looking after the senators and whatever, they actually gag people from talking, they won't let them talk at all. So that's why those were better because we were all mingling with all of you. It wasn't you guys sitting, standing up there talking to us or a panel. You were mingling in with the crowd and you were able to approach each minister and talk to each minister at all of these meetings. So going back to that would be excellent. Would you do that so that the entire community are heard? I'm going to go again. Um, let me just make one comment and then hand over to Michelle. My comment is, and I don't entirely agree with you, Nora, and I as Emma will attest, if we hear anything in the community, we're knocking on MLAs and ministers' doors with what we're hearing. I will add one other thing on climate preparedness. You haven't nailed wood smoke yet. You're a long way from it. And there's a lot of people that, that I understand both sets of views, but there's a lot of people with asthma, coughs, skin ailments, eye infections. They're out there now. You line up with the chemist on a bad day, and there's people in there buying stuff to treat their eyes and their, their coughs. There's people leave town for the cold months. And the recent announcement did not know it. Anyway, I'll leave that over to you, Michelle. Um, I suppose, in a way, um, the question is when you say that you, you know, I'd like to bring those issues to the community for comment, is do you need a community council to do that? Um, in that we organise. <laughs> We organise a meeting, we provide a, you know, a forum, a venue or whatever, but really, um, I guess if government, if you had those questions of the community a little bit, as I suppose, piggybacking on what Nora said, um, is it not possible for the directorates or other people to organise the forums? Yeah, 
And, and we do do that. Um, the consultation for the ACT disability strategy would be a really good example of what's possible. Um, it, that was something where we were looking at what's our strategy for um, disability for the next decade. You know, what's going to drive government agenda for the next decade on this this area of work. We had more than a thousand people participate in that, um, and every single consultation conversation, whether it was a kitchen table conversation, a big in-person forum, an online thing, uh, you know, an on the, um, as in an online forum, or you know, surveys, or people sending in creative submissions. You know, we had people who made a submission in the form of a song um, and in the form of artwork. Um, all of those, every single one of them, was co-designed and led by people with disability, um, which is how it should be done. But there is also, I think, some value in place-based conversations about how does this apply in my local neighbourhood that, that I'm also wanting to hear from as well. And so what I'm wondering is, is, do you think this is something that your community council would like to be part of? Is this something that I can bring to you that, that you think would have value for you as members of your community? Well, I'd ask the question. Um, I think the ACT government is, is very good at outlining strategies and concepts. I think the, oh, yeah. the documents are very good and they're all clear. Where is the where is the communications strategy document that includes community councils? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so tell us tell us what you want basically, and, uh, as you are doing now, and and push it out there and get people talking about it, and then we then we might be able to move on because at the moment we're sort of swimming in a bit of a soupy soupy yeah. thing at the moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're in a state of state of change and trying to work out what. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, I'll just take one little thing. I always, when I see one of those strategies, I ask, where's the action plan? Yes. And where's the deliverables? Where's your KPIs? Those sort of things. Anyway, um, Peter Kane, who's not a local MLA, but he is an MLA, and he is the opposition spokesperson for planning, has popped in. He does watch us frequently online. We know that his name pops up or he sends a text when something's come up as a hot topic and asks me a question. So um, I'd like to welcome him. He's actually a good guy and he's pretty bright, so he can take some hard questions. Up there, up here, up here, yeah, wherever you like there. The floor is yours for a while. Thank you. We won't be. Thank you. Um, look, so Peter uh, here from the neighbouring electorate of Dinandira, and uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm shadow planning minister, and I can sort of have the field to the question, but I guess one thing that I can um, affirm is our position on a planning policy proposal, and that is for block, RZ by blocks that are 800 square metres or larger, we will give the owner the option of separately titling that parcel for the construction of another residential residence which they can then sell or use for their own personal purposes or family purposes. Now, that was our policy leading up to the 2020 election and, and our policy has been sort of mimicked by the ACT government recently, it's just the last few weeks, but they've said that they would only allow the second new residence to be up to 120 square metres basically a big granny flat. So uh, they've adopted a policy of ours, but with a really strange restriction. And I, even though I've asked questions in the assembly over the last couple of weeks, I cannot, have not got an answer as to why they picked that number, and why they would put that restriction on what essentially is our policy. So obviously there's a lot happening in planning. The planning committee will be looking into the, the, the issue recently territory plan and district strategies and design guides. I'll be attending to those hearings very closely. Um, and look, on, on the consultation question which Emma uh, opened up the floor for, uh, you might recall during the planning bill debate, just a few days prior to that, the combined community councils, which includes people like Bill, came out with a media statement saying how appalled they were 
by the government's consultation with the planning review. So the things that I've heard from folk who are here um, have been confirmed in many other areas as well. And in terms of the of, of Emma's offer, say, well, how can we do better? Really, if the government's not willing, it doesn't really matter what you folk do. Sorry, I'm not stop trying to discourage you from saying things, but if the government is not genuine on open conversation, that's not your fault. Uh, it needs a change in attitude, or maybe another change. Uh, and that, and that change, a serious change in attitude of the current government because it's a constant message I hear and certainly the planning review is, a, is an example of failed consultation where at the beginning governance was ruled out as an element of the planning discussions and we have a planning bill, territory plan, we have a totally new planning system with governance obviously intrinsic to the whole operation of it. So that was a quite a misleading start to what has been a terribly flawed consultation, in my opinion, not a genuine desire to consult. So, good luck with your decision making, and thank you for your the community council's role. I think um, I obviously go to the Bill Common one regularly. I do try and pop in them to the other ones, and uh, thank you, Bill, for giving me just a few moments of your time. I'm happy to take questions, but I'm work very your timetable as well. So. Tell me when to sit down, Bill. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, Peter, I've got a question first. Nora, please stay there. You've got the microphone. <laughs> Governance. Um, I know the government has yet to release the terms of reference to the government's review. Yep. I've asked its excessive PPFs for it. That's the Environment Planning Forum. It has not been tabled, and I've got the answer that it, it belongs to the Chief Minister's Directorate. I have now got the names of the two officers doing it, but once again, they don't reply to questions. It was a simple question. Hey guys, can you share your terms of reference? Now, my question to you, and maybe Emma, is, is this being kicked down the road so that it will become the property of the previous assembly and they don't have to implement it? Well, they don't really tell me what their plans are, Bill. <laughs> I'm just giving you a question, yeah, simply. Yes. My no, second no. question, yes. supplementary, uh -huh. or a statement, is the current scenario where the chief planner is the head of the environment planning directorate is entirely unsatisfactory. It's built conflict into the system. The man must be totally conflicted. He may be doing the right thing, but the whole governance thing is opaque. We have no idea. We now have an integrity commission. Maybe they'll lift it and have a look, I don't know. But I would think the government is flirting with a degree of risk that they shouldn't in this space at the moment. Well, there's no question the role should be separate. Um, and in terms of uh, appropriate or inappropriate conduct, I did ask the Chief Planner during estimates just a few months ago. I asked him questions about, does he keep a record of when he meets with developers, etc.? Because um, it's obviously their important conversations that should be on the public, ideally on the public record. And then I asked him, can you define what a developer is? And he could not until he got to the point and say, well, it must, but I'll say it's the same as the Electoral Commission. But it was a series of uncertainties about what is a developer after having told me he actually chronicles when he meets with developers. Now, the problem with that is, if you don't know what a developer is, how do you know you're meeting with one? Mm. And to kick the, kick the ball down the road to say, oh, whatever the Electoral Commissioner defines it, is that the appropriate developer for a chief planner and for a planning department? So that was really quite strange uh, response. It does highlight the fact that there needs to be a specialist chief planner role, and then there needs to be a, an executive director of the planning department as a separate person. Definitely. And this is why I keep on harping on about this governance review, which should, if it's run properly, recommend the two roles be separated. 
you cannot have the man in charge of planning also in charge of the directorate that manages a whole lot of the related entities that need to feed into the planning process. So you can start a related entity you don't like the entity to get from, so they do not have the resources to provide the input into a major planning decision. Certainly. So That's a whole thing. There's probably only a few people who disagree with you, but they're the, the people in charge. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would like to see a question almost every question time on it. And the German speech on it, Peter? Well, it, it can. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion, Bill. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that, and I'll certainly might take up your offer to do so. I'll be in contact. Happy to, happy to write the speech for you. Okay, go, go for it. <laughs> Send me any, all your good ideas. I'm shadow planning minister, as I said. I'm also shadow minister for good ideas. That's not on my business card. <laughs> so please send me through all your brilliant ideas on how camera can be better. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And there has to be a Nora question. Well, <laughs> Hello, Nora. Hi. Lady. I, I need to talk to you privately as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the problem is, to what they didn't listen to, yeah, I'll give myself better to <laughs> that the majority never wanted a life rate. It was in breach of the environmental laws, both local and federal environmental laws, but from getting this too expensive, no one can afford it, and the buses fixed instead. And even the elder to general got in and got stuck into them. Why did it flow out? They wouldn't answer them, they are so rude. They didn't answer that question either, and they still went ahead with it. So really it does need to be stopped. If there's anything you can do, that would be great. I'll take that as a comment. Obviously our position is, we've said, if we're elected as the next government, we won't take it to vote. We will spend three to four billion dollars on some pretty basic services that are fairly lacking in Canberra at the moment, like police, health, basic city services. Thank you for giving me some of your time, Bill. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Hey, my turn. Um, we've got the minutes of the August meeting. Have you all read them? Or put them? Rosemary, who was there, I know. Do you agree? Yes, they're fine. And Val, who was there, seconds that agreement. <laughs> Good on you, Val. Thank you. Um, now, you read the chair report, the newsletter. Uh, we are coming to AGM time. Now, I suspect the majority of the current committee will not renominate in light of the conversation we've had. So, you want to see the committee council continue? I'd suggest you nominate. And if you don't nominate, that's fine too. You need to make a decision about time and effort and whether you think you can add value. Um, up for three years in, over three years in this role. Um, our secretary's been three years, other people have been a number of years and we're going, well, this model, nine meetings determined by a um, do the grant to get a full fair amount of money to rent the room. Now we don't complain about it, we've managed the money quite well, we've got a really good treasure. But we ask them the question, what's the real value we're adding? Is there a better way? Mlongo put up a suggestion. Funnily, we were working on something similar, bouncing through our minds. And we got to around the same answer, and there's a few others who feel that way, but maybe don't have the bravery to go out there and say, hey, this is what we're thinking. The point is, we want to be effective. Can we be effective under the current model? Well, we don't know. We think we are. We've changed lots of things. But the other thing is, have we got the human resources left 
to invest in Kubernetes in the cloud. Um, I, I find it can be <laughs> quite labour and resource intensive and people, I know there's not many people here tonight, when somebody yells at you, go and be a slave in, in Google and says, you're doing a good job. Or gives you a nod, measure money on the wall, if you've got no idea who they are. It's acknowledgement. Um, don't get too many people saying we're not representative. But it's a decision on um, what to do. Now, I, I would hope some new people, maybe some out there online, booking, or somebody knows somebody who's prepared to step forward and um, have a go for a while. Now, we're not saying we're going to walk away and desert anybody. We're quite happy to support people, to support a transition, but I'm not seeing anybody out there uh, at the moment. So, we've got about three weeks for people to put nomination forms in. We've got nomination forms here for committee positions and the forms available on the website. So have a good think about it. Uh, our committee over the last three years had a pretty good time. We've done some pretty good things. Um, we've ignored a few people. Yes, that's the nature of the work. And we've made some people happy. I thought the garden party was a brilliant idea. Um, but it <laughs> just about killed us all, but we did it. We were doing the safety workshop for three years. Yeah. 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 We had a women's safety workshop uh, and we came and did you facilitate it for us? Yeah. 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 I, I just walked around Johnny Wires together and cutting stuff around. Um, so we you know, had some good things happen. And we've had some good times. But um, It'd be good to get people to come in and continue that spirit, to keep that spirit of consultation happening. And, um, you know, like, it'd be good to do it before we've all fallen and heard and walked away. If somebody steps forward and say, hey, I'll do it for a while. Me too, I might say that. Me too, you say that. And, well, next year's going to be really interesting. Chances are you're going to have two elections. Remember that great election forum we had here when we made sure Beck Cody was getting voted out? <laughs> Sorry, interruption. Um, but, but it was a good move. And the, the look of defeat on her face. <laughs> um, the other um, one was the federal one we had here. You With know? all the wannabes here on the stage and people everywhere and right in the middle of the COVID thing. It's good. So, I'll call it quits there unless there's any questions. No? Um, no questions for territory or business? There's no business for minutes, no. Have your say, no. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. I'll call it closed. Thanks,